The message for today is called Games People Play Trivial Pursuit, and we'll be looking at Luke 14, 16 through 24, but first, let's do pray. Help us, Lord, to see your word as a treasure beyond all treasure, as a fountain which can replenish our dry hearts. I pray this in your name. Amen. So I have been preaching a series of sermons sort of based on popular board games. Last Sunday, I looked at a game that was, I think, about 75 years old, Clue. I started two weeks ago with looking at the game of life, which has its origins back in Civil War times. Today, I'm looking at what I think will be the youngest game of this series, uh, unless I find another game or two along the way here. This game is just over 40 years old, but in 1990s, it was called the biggest phenomenon in board game history. And I'm talking about a game called Trivial Pursuit. It was first conceived in Montreal, Canada on December 15th, 1979 by Scott Abbott and Chris Haney. The two Canadian journalists were playing Scrabble and they got into a friendly argument about who was the better game player. As they continued their discussion of board games and the strategies, they decided to create a game of their own. And it only took a few hours to put the basic concept of the game together. And the rest, as they say, is history. The inventors each only had to invest about $1,000 of their own money into the game, and they have become multimillionaires. It's a great American dream, isn't it? Oh, wait a minute, it's a great Canadian dream, I guess. Trivial Pursuit Mania peaked back in 1984. That year, more than 20 million of the board games were sold. Today, still, it's played all over the world, and more than 20 special editions of the game have been issued. So I'm going to ask how many of you have ever played Trivial Pursuit. For those of you who haven't, the object of the game is to collect, I think it was little pie-shaped pieces as you move around the board, by correctly answering questions in categories like you know, people and places, arts and entertainment, history, science, nature, sports, and leisure. Each game has 4,000 questions in the various categories. Important questions like this. What barnyard animal gets sunburned? Or what color is lobster blood? Or what part of the elephant has over 100,000 muscles? The dictionary, Merriam-Webster's online, defines trivia as something of little worth or importance. Another definition is simply unimportant matters. And yet, as I did a little research this past week, I was amazed that there are still trivial pursuit tournaments held all over the country and, frankly, now all over the world. Most of them take place in and around January 4th because it you didn't know that. That's National Trivia Day. Now let that sink in. There's Trivial Pursuit Tournaments. How many of you would like to be crowned the king or queen of unimportant matters of life? Yet if you think about it, our culture is, is consumed really by trivia. In fact, most of us are tempted from time to time by unimportant matters of life. Which leads me to a question, is trivia good or bad in a moral sense? Well, the answer is neither. Trivia, like many other things in life, is what I call immoral, amoral, not immoral. It bears no moral weight. So if you are fascinated by trivia, if you happen to be good at Trivial Pursuit or Jeopardy or whatever type of a trivia program you like to use, don't fret. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing sinful about that. Some people's minds just work that way. But as I've thought about it, the, the real danger of the trivial is that the trivial often squeezes out what really matters in life. We, caught up in, we get caught up in things that are of no lasting value. We end up not having the time and energy for the things that really do matter. So it's really important that we put our priorities in the right order. A passage for today is a parable, very similar to the one that I preached back on June 7th from Matthew 22. It's like it, but it's not the same. It was told at a different time. It's recorded by a different person. You'll be 
likely to recognize the story, but I want you to think about it today in terms of things that matter and things that don't matter or things that wind up just being trivial. But think about in terms of how do we prioritize the important things in life. That being said, here is Luke 14, verses 16 through 24. Listen to the inspired word of God. So a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married and I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The heart of this parable is found in a very simple truth that priorities matter. The problem, of course, is how do you decide between competing priorities in, in life? It's a situation we all face today. It's not like we're trying to decide between mowing the grass or robbing a bank. Well, at least I hope we're not trying to decide between those two. I think this is more about rather mundane decisions. When we face a difficult task of, of sorting between good priorities of life, maybe such as me deciding to watch a rerun of Monk or working on next week's sermon. Well, seriously, the types of choices that we face today are the tough kind. Tough kind because we need to decide between what is good and what is best. We're not always having to decide between what is good and evil. And I believe the passage today has some help for us in answering this question. Is this a trivial pursuit? I want to look at what Jesus says here. First way to decide what's going on or to look at what we need to do is to figure out who it is who is calling. And I get that from verse 17 of the text where it says, At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. You see, the he, the guy throwing the party, very clearly is meant to be God. And the servants in the story, well, they stand for you and me. So it is really God who is issuing the invitation to come to the party. And it's us that he's urging to go out and extend that invitation to other people. Now, I've got something to admit to you. I'm not a big partier. Uh, that's not a surprise, right? It's not that I'm antisocial. I'm just anti-party. No, no, really. I've, I've never been outgoing enough to really get into any sort of party scene especially when I was younger, but now that I've reached a ripe old partying age of, well, I'm well over 60 now, you understand. But think of the party God wants to throw for us. Why in the world would any of us want to miss that party? And a related question is this. If we really believe God's party is going to be awesome as we say it is, why in the world would you and I keep it a secret? What's keeping us from telling everyone about it? Consider who it is who is calling. It's the God of the universe calling you and me. He's inviting us to join with him. A second way that Jesus offers for us to sort out our priorities is to remember that character counts. So in this story, in this sermon illustration, in the parable, after this invitation is extended by God, Look at what the people's excuses were. It says in verse 18, they all alike began to make excuses. Notice how weak and lame the excuses that these guys and figures, it was guys, give are. I mean, they're worse than the ones that I would come up with. Let me ask you, 
Who buys property sight unseen? Nobody does that. But the first one says he's just bought a field, and now he has to go out and look at it. Oh, that's lame. The second guy says he's just bought five yoke of oxen. That's 10 oxen yoked together. Anyone back then, frankly, it's probably even true now, who could afford to buy that many animals probably afforded many farmhands, and any one of them had could have been able to go to try out the oxen. I mean, after all, the farmhands are the ones who are going to be using the oxen, not necessarily the guy who bought them, so why does he suddenly need to try them out? Now, the third guy says that he just got married, so he can't come. Now, that's the only excuse that holds water with me, but as you read the passage, it holds no sway with Jesus. The bridegroom, if you think about it, would have had plenty of advance notice to plan to go to the banquet. And even though the invite would have gone to the man only, the bride might have just loved to have gone with the guy to the party. And let's face it, no man who has just gotten married is going to openly admit that his wife just won't let him go somewhere. No way. That excuse doesn't hold water. I guess what I'm talking about right now is the difference between an excuse and a reason. Now, you teachers out there know what I'm talking about. You've heard all the excuses. What's the classic one? The dog ate my homework, right? Excuses are for people who are trying to get out of things. Reasons are valid causes as to why you can't do something. Excuses are bad. Reasons are, well, they're reasonable. They're acceptable. When you excuse yourself for something, and let's face it, when you don't want to do something, and then any old excuse will do, like watching a rerun of Monk. But you've got to be on guard when you do that about character issues. So in your deciding between alternate courses of action, you need to ask yourself the very difficult character question. Will either of these choices cause me to jeopardize my character? Can I do either of these choices in good conscience? If you just think about it that way, oftentimes this will help you clarify the issue or to clarify the decisions that you need to make. The final way to sort out our priorities in this passage is really to look at the consequences of the particular course of action. Are the consequences going to be trivial? Or are they going to be amazingly huge or treacherous? And that's really what this passage is is teaching us in the last verse. Listen to this again with me. The master's thrown the party, remember that as God, and he says to the servant, you and me, I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. This is one of the very difficult and hard sayings of scripture. But Jesus is so clear right here. Not one person who refuses the invitation is going to be given a makeup date for the banquet. The consequences are grave for those who refuse to come. The text says that they will never taste what God has to offer. The meaning, of course, is that the things of eternity that God offers to us are not trivial. To turn down the things of God is not a light and trivial matter. Again, the trivial stuff isn't bad unless it draws us away from the important things of life, which trivia, I suppose, is very prone to do. Well, even though I am a confirmed and sometimes dour Calvinist, we all face choices. And I'd like to offer you this morning some additional help with choices. Years ago, I heard a pastor, I think it was back out when we were in California, who used the acronym STP. Now, do you know what STP is? Well, STP is a, a gas and oil additive product for your car, and supposedly it makes your engine run smoother and better. Now, my first car was a 1966 Mercury, and it would not run well without a six ounce bottle of STP. I think I had to put it in every tank of gas, and that didn't always do the trick. Now, STP is, is a preventative that is still around, and supposedly it keeps your car running good. Anyway, I want you to think of STP. The S in STP starts, uh, stands for start. Start your day with Jesus. Nothing will keep you out of trouble 
and on track better or quicker than taking a moment at the beginning of each day to thank God for the day, to seek his guidance, to seek his will for your life, a way to just offer that day to God to be used by him, to be useful for him. I love the movie Groundhog Day, and in it, actor Bill Murray plays this arrogant Scrooge-like weatherman who spends the night in Punxsutawney, although we all know the film wasn't filmed in Punxsutawney. Anywhere, he spends the night in Punxsutawney where he's supposed to broadcast the annual ritual of the groundhog coming out to check for his shadow. Boy, that's another story I don't want to get into today as far as the reality of that groundhog. Anyway, in the movie, he wakes up, does his story, and he's annoyed to discover he is trapped in Punxsutawney for a second night because of a snowstorm that comes in after the groundhog ceremony. When he wakes up the next morning, he discovers to his dismay that it is the morning of the day before all over again. And everything that happened to him the day before happens to him all over again, and so it goes day after day. Each day is the same as the day before, with the same events repeating themselves again and again and again like a broken record, which actually plays a part in the film also. Eventually, Murray's character figures out that if he does the same things, well, events will repeat themselves as they were in the original day. But if he changes his behavior even slightly, people will respond to his new actions opening up all kinds of possibilities for things to change. The movie, amongst other things, is sort of a parable of modern life. Many people live their lives the way Bill Murray did in that movie. We keep on doing the same old things, and we keep getting the same old results. Here's what I want to encourage you about this morning. Start your day with Jesus and see if things don't change. And by the way, I'm not talking about having a massive two-hour quiet time of prayer and devotions. Those things aren't bad, by the way. I'm encouraging you to get things started with just a quick, God, thank you for this day. I pray that you'll use me today, that I know and love you more at the end of this day than I do right now. My friends, start your day with Jesus. That's the S. The T in STP stands for time. By this, I mean is how you spend your time is how you'll spend your life. And I realize what I'm saying here isn't particularly deep, but I think we need that occasional reminder that you and I are given 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week, 8,836 hours in a year. So we need to look at how we're spending our time. Are we spending our time on trivial pursuits that, although they are amoral, but they're still not allowing us to live life in full, life abundant that I talked about a couple of weeks ago. Good STP, preventative maintenance on our priorities, comes really, I think, with examining how we are spending our time and if need be reordering our time to reflect our highest priorities and deepest values. Finally, the P in STP stands for people. And by that I mean that to keep our priorities straight, we must remember that people matter more than things. I've been thinking about this 16 years ago. Susie and I both lost our fathers, and that happened within a 10-month period. And I can guarantee you this, Susie and I do not wish that we had spent more time away from our fathers. Obviously, we think to the contrary. You see, people... Of course, since then, we've lost our mothers also. But people matter more than things. I think the older I get, the more I realize this. Jesus, of course, lived that way also. He knew that people matter and that there is no treasure in the world, no banquet, no invitation that equals that of God our Father through Christ Jesus. He offers eternity with him. That's not a trivial matter. Like Jesus said in the parable, the invitation has been given. It has. This is not trivial information that I'm sharing with you right now. This is life-changing. This is eternal. I think I'm going to leave it right there. I have more written, but I'm going to stop there. Today's game and today's message 
is really a healthy reminder for all of us that so much in our lives is, is trivial pursuit. We get caught up in them. But the Bible, but Jesus ultimately tells us that in the final analysis, an awful lot of what we do is trivial pursuit. There's an invitation out there for you and I, and I'm going to ask, have you accepted that invitation? Are your priorities in line with what Jesus teaches here? I would beg you, I would ask you that in the upcoming week, that you would spend some time, maybe first thing in the morning, thinking about these things. Amen.